<laughs> this is so much fun. It's great coming to you. You don't know how much fun it is having Mel zip over all the way over from Europe, and I'm here in the United States. Zoom puts us together, and all I'm doing is, for, for, like the rest of you, I'm hearing this for the first time, and it makes so much sense to me. I hope it's making sense to you. This, this is what we love, doing research in the century where Islam supposedly took place, we're finding an entirely different environment, an entirely different environment, but which became the foundation and the nascent uh, uh, narrative of what later did become Islam. And that's why it's so good to help people like A.J. Dios and this David Mitchell now and you, Mel, putting it together, making sense of it all. And then what we're doing is we're taking and bring it to you as white papers. These are what we call white papers, looking at, at like what if scenarios. This is what we think is happening because this is what seems to be happening on the ground. And we've done this with the Christian environment using Mahmoud. We've done this uh, with now with looking at the Jews, but we haven't really looked at the Jews in that it, as from the seventh century to see where did they use this title, Mahmud? Because Mahmud was well used. It was the praised one. Looks like everybody in Iraq and up in Syria, up where the Arabs were speaking, that's the Arab-speaking world. Mahmud was an Arabic term. It comes from the same term that we have in Hebrew for Mahmud, which is in Song of Solomon 5.16. That's referring to Solomon himself as the altogether lovely one. And then St. Ambrose in the 4th century applied it to Jesus Christ himself. He was the praised one, the lovely one, the altogether lovely, the Messiah. So by the time it gets to the 7th century, it's, it, 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 Mel, it's, been, it's moving into really a term, a title for the Messiah, in both in Hebrew and in Arabic. We're, we're dealing with the Arabic here, and we're looking at Jews who are living in the Arabic area. They would have spoken both Hebrew and they would have spoken Arabic as well. And they are also looking and anticipating the Messiah coming for the first time. The Christians are looking for the Messiah coming the second time. In the last episode, we, whoop, there go my balloons. Let me just let the balloons go. They get so excited, this computer of mine. It just loves to come alongside me and throw the balloons up. So here you have the Jews assuming that these exilarchs are these Messiahs. They're looking for two Messiahs. And now we're going to go back and look and see what we can see concerning the, the Hijra itself, looking at what the dates show us. So, Mel, back to you. Help us with these dates and see if we can nail this down somewhere in the 7th century. Okay, so I suppose the first thing I would say is um, if you delve into all the sources about when, not is Islam started, but when the Tayyaye started their rebellion, let's say. Uh, if we look at that, you find that there are two Be separate though, traditions. For, 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 for people that don't know who you're talking about, the Tayyaye are northern Iraq, all right? They're, they're what we know as the Lakhmids from northern Iraq. That's right, yeah. They're kind of a, a transnational tribe, a really massive tribe, mostly in Iraq, a little bit into Syria, and they're composed of Christians, Jews, and Arabs of of no particular religious affiliation. So they're quite, it's quite a broad term. Um, so something happened, uh, a new state happened, a rebellion, uh, mostly made up of Arabs and, but what you have is two traditions. One tradition is the one that we're familiar with the year of the Hijra 622 AD. The problem is if you look at the coins, if you look at the early inscriptions, it doesn't refer to the year of the Hijra. It refers to the year of the Arabs, which is a totally different thing. That, that hijra idea comes later. So obviously there's a lot of backdating with concepts. So that's the first issue. The second issue is 622 isn't the only suggested beginning of this state, as it were. 617 is another one. Um, and uh, I've had discussions with uh, Dr. Robert Kerr about this, and I'm saying, oh no, there's, there's three sources that refer to 617. He says, no, 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 but there's other sources that refer to 622. And it's a question of why is there this anomaly between these two? Today's video, we're going to try and resolve that and see that actually it might actually come down to the fact that there were two messiahs. One of the dates has got to do with the significance of the first messiah, 617. And the second one, and this is, a, uh, this is just a possibility, it might have to do with the second messiah, the messiah ben David, 
at least from their perception at that time. So that's the idea. Jump in here real quickly, just so people, just to remind people, from the last video we went through this last episode, didn't we? We talked about Messiah ben Joseph and Messiah ben David, and one was Nehemiah ben Hushiel, and the other one would have been Shalom, his brother. Yeah. Who turned so out. First one, <laughs> yeah, two separate messiahs from a Jewish perspective. One was the suffering servant concept. The other one was the conquering king. So with that out of the way, I'm going to just share the slides here. Um, okay, so um, 617 AD, that's a significant year. We, we saw that it was the year Nehemiah died. Okay, seems a very significant year. Um, you kind of have to imagine what would um, millions of Jews do if their exilarch was murdered. It, it, it's bound to create a reaction. And what happened is there was a massive rebellion against you know the states at that time whether they be the byzantines or the persians um, now we have three sources that refer to the tayyayi the which are that big tribe in iraq rebelling against the persians and the byzantines at that time so according to the official message of the tayyayi's envoy to the tang court in china 651 they say it had been 34 years since the founding of the Dashi, which is the Chinese word for the Taiyaye. Okay, it's recorded in the old book of Tan and the Sifu Wan Gi. So two separate books are recorded in, so good source, it's an official source. That gives us a year of 617, 618, depending on when you uh, count the beginning of the year. So that's one source. Second one is in a letter from the ruler of Kang, which is Samarkand, he's requesting military assistance from the Tang Emperor. And the letter says that this year, 719 AD, is the 100th year since the founding of Dashi. Um, due to discrepancies, again, we could say, depending whether it's spring or autumn, that could have a year of 617 or 618. So that's consistent, I would suggest, with that first source. Then we have a third source, which is from the Hispanic Chronicle of 754, and it gives a similar uh, year. It says 618, okay? The Saracens rebelled in 618, the seventh year of the Emperor Heraclius, and appropriated for themselves Syria, Arabia, and Mesopotamia. More through trickery than through the power of their leader, Mahmed. Again, this Mahmed could be just their messiah, their, the messiah figure. Um, and they devastated the neighboring provinces, proceeding not so much by means of open attacks as by secret incursions. Thus, by means of cunning and fraud rather than power, they incited all of the frontier cities of the empire and finally rebelled openly, shaking the yoke from their necks. Okay? So, I think that's solid evidence that at least some of the people of that time believed that 617, 618 was the beginning of it all. Now, we're not even looking at Islam yet. Islam is like 100, 200 years away. But this is the beginning of everything. This is, they're kicking out the Byzantines, they're kicking out the Persians, they're, they're doing something new here. They've got a Messiah that they're following, um, and they're really excited, and it's an apocalyptic time. Uh, and during apocalyptic times, what can typically happen is new religions are formed because you have now re new religious leaders with new ideas. You know, all of that kind of stuff can happen in the one go. Now, the second thing is to do with 622. And this part is speculative. So um, this is not factual in, in the sense of I'm throwing out an idea. I'm, I'm offering a suggestion for why 622 was also another uh, year, uh, the founding year. It doesn't quite match up with the 617, 618. So this is to do with the exilarch Shalom, who was this, the brother of Nehemiah bin Huziel. When that rebellion happened, who was the person that was leading the Jews at that time? It was Shalom. Okay. Now, according to Ben Abramson and Joseph Katz, these are both Jewish writers, uh, and they have a, a paper there, the name is there if, if people want to look it up. The distrust between the Jews and Husro reached its lowest point. 
as the Jews said that Husro had acted treacherously and plotted the assassination of Nehemiah, there arose great discord between the Allies, which ended in the deportation of many Jews to Persia. Shalom, Nehemiah's brother, was sold into slavery, or now I'm putting in simply deported because this sold into slavery, I put a big question mark. Is that really what happened or was it something like that? And they've exaggerated it until his redemption 10 years later. Now, it could be that Shalom was just simply either expelled from the from Jerusalem um, or deported. So it's not quite as strong as sold into slavery. Now, it also says that the Persians placed a certain Christian archpriest named Modestos over the city as governor. So Shalom had been governor. He gets kicked out of Jerusalem and is sent to Persia, somewhere in Persia. Now, if if you go back two years ago, uh, you remember that Paul Ellis had a thesis called the Jerusalem thesis. And in that thesis, he proposed that the various references to um, the the house that the holy house, the the Masjid Al Haram, that's referred to in the Quran, is actually referring to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. So that, from his perspective, Jerusalem is the original Mecca. That's that's where the context is. So now you have this guy called Shalom, who's the Axelarch, who the Jews thought was the Mahmed. He's driven out of Jerusalem. He's sent to Persia. And he's sent away for how long? Ten years. This sounds very similar to the story of Muhammad in the standard Islamic narrative. Muhammad goes away for ten years and then eventually returns as a conquering leader, conquering Mecca again. Okay, so the deportation happens somewhere towards the the Persian Empire. Um, we have Iraq and you also have Iran here in this. Mahosia. Mahosa even is the capital of the Persian Empire. Okay, you can see there we have Sura and Al Hira as well. Now, if we zoom into Mahosa, it's actually two cities, Seleuca and Tesiphon. Tesiphon's old name is Medina Al Atika, the old city. So Medina just means city. So if Paul Ellis is correct that Jerusalem was the old was the original Mecca. And if, and this is a big if, if it's, this is speculation. So if this Shalom, who Jews thought was the Messiah, is sent away and ends up in Medina, this could be the origin of that, that mythology around Muhammad. So this is kind of a, a way to explain that there was something there in the history, but it's all got distorted over time and be, has become mythology about this Arabian prophet. It's got nothing to do with an Arabian prophet, just simply a Jewish exarch, I would I would argue. Okay, so I just emphasize that this is a bit of speculation here, so you'll have to bear with me. A deportation of Shalom from Jerusalem for 10 years might be the origin of the idea of the Hijra. However, I couldn't find a date for when Shalom was exiled from Jerusalem and sent to Persia. Um, but if it happened in 622, then that would be bingo. That would be like a perfect explanation. Then we might have the origin of the 622 Hijra date. Um, the two distinct dates from the beginning of the Tayyayi state, otherwise known as the year of the Arab, would appear to be linked with Nehemiah bin Huziel's deaths. That's Messiah bin Joseph. And possibly Exilarch Shalom bin Huziel's exile, Messiah bin David. So what I can confirm is Ben Huziel definitely got killed in 617. There are traditions that say Shalom was sent into exile as well. So you have those two. Um, and the history is is pretty um, empty for some reason. They've, it's like as if they wiped that whole history from the history books for some reason. Um, but that's as far as we can get with that. So in conclusion, we have definite evidence of a Jewish belief that Nehemiah bin Hushiel was the Messiah bin Joseph, and they expected another exarch to be the Messiah bin David. We also have evidence from a 6th century Jewish inscription of the use of Mahmed just three years be, um, after exarch Zutra II was killed by the Persians. It's a fair assumption that talk of the Mahmed in the 7th century is a messianic expectation. 
in relation to the death of exilarch Nehemiah bin Hushio. Jews use the word to refer to the Messiah. His brother Shalom is remembered strongly in the Sin as a companion of Muhammad, and he's sent to exile, so that could be the origin of the Hijra dating. Um, and if we knew for definite when he was sent into exile, if it turned out to be 622, I think that would be a really rubber stamping the idea that that's the, the origin of that story. The, the Hijra dating seems to be really strong on the tradition. So it must have been something significant in that time frame for, for it to be remembered as being that important, you know. So hand it back to you, Jay. Okay, good stuff. So really what you're saying here, uh, much like you're, this is kind of carrying on from the last episode, the Jews there in the 7th century, uh, they are, you're saying that Shalom was in Jerusalem, but you're saying Hushel was over there in Iraq or in Hira. Okay, so uh, Nehemiah bin Hushel would normally, the Axlarks normally would be resident in essentially Baghdad as a, uh, we're not 100% uh, certain when Baghdad started. We we assume it's in the 750s. There might be uh, an earlier. Well, 100 years later. So we're really talking yeah. about, it's not Baghdad that it is Tessafan or, Tessafan or somewhere or around there. Yeah. So we, yeah. but you're but that's where the Ben Husha was. His brother was in Jerusalem. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So just to, what was unusual at that time was Nehemiah, bin Husiel would normally be resident over in Iraq, but the Persians had allowed him to become governor of Jerusalem because they had they had cooperated in the conquering of Jerusalem. And it's kind of like a reward for him in, in helping in that conquering of Jerusalem that he became the governor. Um, then his brother Shalom, uh, they, um, he was deported to Persia. Um, so I'm suggesting that that's the origin of the of the story of the hijra i hope that makes sense okay all right yeah we'll go with that so we do have this whole this whole context that we need to look at in the seventh century from a jewish perspective and that is this these messiah figures these exilarchs these rulers of the jews who are in the diaspora they're not in jerusalem right now they're way over in mostly iraq in uh they are the ones who are seen as the coming messiah and in this case, two messiahs, uh, the one Ben Joseph, the other one Ben David. Ben Joseph would be the suffering uh, messiah, and then Ben David would be the conquering messiah. So Ben Husiel was the suffering one. He then is killed. He is, I'm sure, he is executed, which starts the rebellion of the Arabs. Now, the rebellion of the Arabs is significant because that's taking place there in Iraq. They're upset, and that would may be that why then the, 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 the year of the Arabs as it's well known, well, starts with that killing. Interestingly, you're also saying that in 622, Shalom, who is then going to be the one that takes over, he was to send into exile. That could be 622. May I ask one? May I suggest one other thing? That's also yeah. oh, there go the balloons. Let's wait for the balloons to go. May I suggest another thing? Uh, you remember that's also the year that uh, Heraclius destroys the Persians, who have been the ones who have been dominating the Arabs, especially dominating the Jews. So could that also be 622, the year that they are rejoicing? That's the year of the Arabs, because they're now free from the yoke of the Sassanians, the Persians. That's yeah. another possibility. Absolutely, yeah. So, you and I have talked about that many times before. But in yeah. any, irregardless... What we're looking at is we're trying to see, we're trying to find historical references to these exilarchs who were seen as the rulers, who were seen as the Messiah figures, which is the word Mahmud, which is the Arabic de de derivative for the Messiah in both Hebrew and also in Arabic. So this makes all the sense in the world. The Jews also have a Mahmud. The Christians have a Mahmud. Both of them are the Messiah figures. Both of them are known as the praise one or the 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 lovely one the messiah the altogether lovely that's both in the bible and also on the lips of the jews there in the seventh century great stuff we put an awful lot into this mel i want to thank you so much now for the next episode we're going to actually bring it all together make sense at all so you can all use it in your own ministries but until then go ahead and put your comments down below we want to see what you have to say you can either agree or disagree that's the beautiful thing about youtube 
and try to see if this makes sense from the paradigm from what you're coming up with and how this can be used in our ministry. Right, Mel, thanks so much. Thanks for being on board. Thanks for coming along. Can't wait for the next one, the last one. This is Jay and Mel, over and out. Mm -hmm.